The Gulag Archipelago Abridged, Part 4, The Soul and Barbed Wire Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 1 Corinthians 15.51 Part 4, Chapter 1, The Ascent And the years go by, not in swift staccato as they joke in camp, Winter, summer, winter, summer, but in a long drawn out autumn, an endless winter, an unwilling spring, and only a summer that is short. Even one mere year, whew, how long it lasts! Even in one year, how much time is left for you to think? For three hundred sixty five days, you stomp out to line up in a drizzling, slushy rain, and in a piercing blizzard and in a biting and still sub-zero cold. For three hundred sixty-five days you work away at hateful alien work with your mind unoccupied. For three hundred sixty-five evenings you squinch up, wet, chilled, in the end of work line-up, waiting for the convoy to assemble from the distant watchtowers. And then there is the march out, and the march back, and the bending down over seven hundred and thirty bowls of gruel, over seven hundred thirty portions of grits, yes, and waking up and going to sleep on your multiple bunk, and neither radio nor books to distract you. There are none, and thank God. And that is only one year, and there are ten, there are twenty-five. And then, too, when you are lying in the hospital with dystrophy, that, too, is a good time. To think. Think! draw some conclusions from misfortune. And all that endless time, after all, the prisoners' brains and souls are not inactive. In the mass and from a distance they seem like swarming lice, but they are the crown of creation, right? After all, once upon a time a weak little spark of God was breathed into them too. Is it not true? So what has become of it now? For centuries it was considered that a criminal was given a sentence for precisely this purpose, to think about his crime for the whole period of his sentence, be conscience-stricken, repent, and gradually reform. But the Gulag Archipelago knows no pangs of conscience. Out of the one hundred natives, five are thieves, and their transgressions are of no reproach in their own eyes, but a mark of valor. They dream of carrying out such feats in the future even more brazenly and cleverly. They have nothing to repent. Another five stole on a big scale, but not from people. In our times, the only place where one can steal on a big scale is from the state, which itself squanders the people's money without pity or sense. So what was there for such types to repent of? Maybe that they had not stolen more and divvied up, and thus remained free. And, so as far as another 85% of the natives were concerned, they had never committed any crimes, whatever. What were they supposed to repent of? That they had thought what they thought? No, not only do you not repent, but you clean your conscience, like a clear mountain lake shines in your eyes. And your eyes, purified by suffering, infallibly perceive the least haze in other eyes, for example, they infallibly pick out the stool pigeons, and the Cheka GB is not aware of this capacity of ours to see with the eyes of truth. It is our secret weapon against that institution. It was in this nearly unanimous consciousness of our innocence that the main distinction arose between us and the hard labor prisoners of Dostoevsky. There they were conscious of being doomed renegades whereas we were confidently aware that they could haul in any free person at all in just the same way they had hauled us in. That barbed wire was only a nominal dividing line between us. In earlier times there had been among the majority the unconditional consciousness of personal guilt, and among us the consciousness of disaster on a mammoth scale. Just to not perish from the disaster, it had to be survived. Wasn't this the root cause of the astounding rarity of camp suicides? Yes, rarity, although every ex-prisoner could in all probability recall a case of suicide, but he could recall even more escapes. There were certainly more escapes than suicides. 
admirers of socialist realism can praise me. I am pursuing an optimistic line. And there were far more self-inflicted injuries, too, than there were suicides. But this, too, is an act indicating love of life, a straightforward calculation of sacrificing a portion to save the whole. I even imagine that, statistically speaking, there were fewer suicides per thousand of the population in camp than in freedom. I have no way of verifying this, of course. It is a very spectacular idea to imagine all the innocently outraged millions beginning to commit suicide in mass, causing double vexation to the government, both by demonstrating their innocence and by depriving the government of free manpower. And maybe the government would have had to soften up and begin to take pity on its subjects? Well, hardly. Stalin wouldn't have been stopped by that. He would have merely picked up another twenty million people from freedom. But it did not happen. People died by the hundreds of thousands and millions, driven, it would seem, to the extremity of extremities. But for some reason, there were no suicides. Condemned to a mishappen existence, to waste away from starvation, to exhaustion from labor, they did not put an end to themselves. And thinking the whole thing over, I found that proof to be the stronger. A suicide is always a bankrupt, always a human being in a blind alley, a human being who has gambled his life and lost, and is without the will to continue the struggle. If these millions of helpless and pitiful vermin still did not put an end to themselves, this meant some kind of invincible feeling was alive inside them, some very powerful idea. This was their feeling of universal innocence. It was the sense of an ordeal of the entire people, like a Tatar yoke. But what if one has nothing to repent of? What then? What then does the prisoner think about all the time? Poverty and prison give wisdom. They do. But where is it to be directed? Here is how it was with many others, not just with me. Our initial first prison sky consisted of black swirling storm clouds and black pillars of volcanic eruptions. This was the heaven of Pompeii, the heaven of the Day of Judgment because it was not just anyone who had been arrested, but I, the center of this world. Our last prison sky was infinitely high, infinitely clear, even paler than sky blue. We all, except religious believers, began from one point. We tried to tear our hair from our head, but our hair had been clipped close. How could we have not seen those who informed against us? How could we have not seen our enemies? and how we hated them. How could we avenge ourselves on them? And what recklessness, what blindness, how many errors, how can they be corrected? They must be corrected all the more swiftly. We must write, we must speak out, we must communicate. But there is nothing that we can do, and nothing is going to save us. Then there begins the period of transit prisons, Interspersed with our thoughts about our future camp, we now love to recall our past. How well we used to live, even if we lived badly. But how many unused opportunities there were. When will we now make up for it? If I only manage to survive, oh, how differently, how wisely, I am going to live. The day of our future release, it shines like a rising sun. And the conclusion is... Survive to reach it. Survive at any price. This is simply a turn of phrase, a sort of habit of speech. At any price. But then the words swell up with their full meaning, and an awesome vow takes shape. To survive at any price. And whoever takes that vow, whoever does not blink before its crimson burst, allows his own misfortune to overshadow both the entire common misfortune and the whole world. This is the great fork of camp life. From this point the roads go to the right and to the left. One of them will rise and the other will descend. If you go to the right, you lose your life. And if you go to the left, you lose your conscience. One's own order to oneself, survive, is the natural splash of a living person. Who does not wish to survive? Who does not have the right to survive? 
straining all the strength of our body and order to all our cells, survive. A powerful charge is introduced into the chest cavity, and the heart is surrounded by an electrical cloud so as to not stop beating. They lead thirty emaciated but wirely zacks three miles across the Arctic ice to a bathhouse. The bath is not worth even a warm word. Six men at a time wash themselves in five shifts, and the door opens straight into the sub-zero temperature, and all four shifts are obliged to stand there before or after bathing, because they cannot be left without convoy, and not only does none of them get pneumonia, they don't even catch cold, and for ten years one old man had his bath just like that, serving out his term from age fifty to sixty. But then he was released. He was at home. Warm and cared for, he burned up in one month's time. That order, survive, was not there. But simply to survive does not yet mean at any price. At any price means at the price of someone else. Let us admit the truth. At that great fork in the camp road, at the great divider of souls, it was not the majority of the prisoners that turned to the right. Alas, not the majority, but fortunately neither was it just a few. There are many of them, human beings, who made this choice, but they did not shout about themselves. You had to look closely to see them. Dozens of times this same choice had arisen before them, too, but they always knew, and they knew their own stand. Take Arnold Susie, who was sent to camp at the age of about fifty. He had never been a believer, but he had always been fundamentally decent. He had never led any other kind of life, and he was not about to begin any other. He was a Westerner, and what that meant was that he was doubly unprepared, and kept putting his foot into it all the time, and getting into serious difficulties. He worked at general work, and he was imprisoned in a penalty camp, and he still managed to survive. He survived exactly the same kind of person he had been when he came to camp. I knew him at the very beginning, and I knew him afterward. And I can testify personally. True, there were three seriously mitigating circumstances which accompanied him throughout his camp life. He was classified as an invalid. For several years he received parcels. And thanks to his musical abilities, he got some additional nourishment out of amateur theatricals. But these three circumstances only explain why he survived. If they had not existed, he would have died. But he would not have changed. And perhaps those who died did die because they did not change. And Tereshkovic, a perfectly ordinary, straightforward person, recalls, There were many prisoners prepared to grovel for a bread rationed or a puff of Makorka smoke. I was dying, but I kept my soul pure. I always called a spade a spade. It has been known for many centuries that prison causes the profound rebirth of a human being. The examples are innumerable, such as that of Silvio Pellico. Through serving eight years, he was transformed from a furious carbonero to a meek Roman Catholic. In our country, they always mention Dostoevsky in this respect. These transformations always proceed in the direction of deepening the soul. Ibsen wrote, from lack of oxygen, even the conscience will wither. By no means, it is by not any means so simple. In fact, it is the opposite. Take General Gorbatov. He had fought from his very youth, advanced through the ranks of the army, and at no time at all in which to think about things. But he was imprisoned, and how good it was. Various events awakened within his recollection, such as his having suspected an innocent man of espionage, or having ordered by mistake the execution of a quite innocent Pole. Well, when else would he have remembered this? After rehabilitation, he did not remember such things very much. Enough has been written about prisoners' changes of heart to raise it to the level of penological theory. For example, in the pre-revolutionary prison herald, Lukinetsky wrote, Darkness renders a person more sensitive to light, Involuntary inactivity imprisonment arouses in him a thirst for life, movement, work. The quiet compels profound pondering over his own I, over surrounding conditions, over his past and present, and forces him to think about his future. 
Our teachers, who had never served time themselves, felt for the prisoners only the natural sympathy of the outsider. Dostoevsky, however, who served time himself, was a proponent of punishment, and this was something worth thinking about. The proverb says, Freedom spoils, and lack of freedom teaches. But Pelico and Lukanetsky wrote about prison, but Dostoevsky demanded punishment in prison. But what kind of lack of freedom is it that educates? Camp? That is something to think about. Of course, they were not concerned with our souls when they pumped up the archipelago. But nonetheless, is it really hopeless to stand fast in camp? And more than that, was it really impossible for one's soul to rise in camp? Here is E. K., who was born around 1940, one of those boys who, under Khrushchev, gathered to read poems on Mayakovsky's square, but were hauled off instead in Black Marias. From camp, from a Potma camp, he writes to his girl, Here all the trivia and fuss have decreased. I have experienced a turning point. Here you hearken to that voice deep inside you, which amid the surfeit and vanity used to be stifled by the roar from outside. At the Samarka camp in 1946, a group of intellectuals had reached the very brink of death. They were worn down by hunger, cold, and work beyond their powers, and they were even deprived of sleep. They had nowhere to lie down. Dugout barracks had not yet been built. Did they go and steal, or squeal, or whimper about their ruined lives? No. Foreseeing the approach of death in days rather than weeks, here is how they spent their last sleepless leisure, sitting up against the wall. Timofeyev Rosovsky gathered them into a seminar, and they hastened to share with one another what one of them knew and the others did not. They delivered their last lectures to each other. Father Savely spoke of unshameful death, a priest academician about patristics, one of the Uniat fathers, about something in the area of dogmatics and canonical writings, an electrical engineer on the principles of energetics of the future, and a Leningrad economist on how the effort to create principles of Soviet economics had failed for the lack of new ideas. Timofeyev Rasovsky himself talked about the principles of microphysics. From one session to the next, participants were missing. They were already in the morgue. That is the sort of person who can be interested in all this while already growing numb with approaching death. Now that is an intellectual. Pardon me, you love life? You? You? You who exclaim and sing over and over and dance it too. I love you life. Oh, I love you life, do you? Well, go on. Love it. Camp life. Love that too. It too is life. There where there is no struggle with fate... There you will resurrect your soul. You haven't understood a thing. When you get there, you'll collapse. Along our chosen road are twists and turns and twists and turns. Uphill or up into the heavens. Let's go, let's stumble and stagger. The day of liberation. What can it give us after so many years? We will change unrecognizably and so will our near and dear ones and places which were once dear to us will seem stranger than strange, and the thought of freedom after a time even becomes a forced thought, far-fetched, strange. The day of liberation, as if there were any liberty in this country, or as if it were possible to liberate anyone who has not first become liberated in his own soul. The stones roll down from under our feet, downward into the past. They are the ashes of the past, and we ascend. It is a good thing to think in prison, but it is not bad in camp either, because, and this is the main thing, there are no meetings. For ten years you are free from all kinds of meetings. Is that not mountain air, while they openly claim your labor and your body to the point of exhaustion and even death, the camp keepers do not encroach at all on your thoughts. They do not try to screw down your brains and to fasten them in place, and this results in a sensation of freedom of much greater magnitude than the freedom of one's feet to run along on the level. 
No one tries to persuade you to apply for party membership. No one comes around to squeeze membership dues out of you in voluntary societies. There is no trade union, the same kind of protector of your interests as an official lawyer before a tribunal. And there are no production meetings. You cannot be elected to any position. You cannot be appointed some kind of delegate. And the really important thing is that they cannot compel you to be a propagandist, nor to listen to propaganda, nor will they ever drag you off to the electoral precinct to vote freely and secretly for a single candidate. No one requires any socialist undertakings of you, nor self-criticism of your mistakes, nor articles in the wall newspaper, nor an interview with a provincial correspondent. A free head. Now is that not an advantage of life in the archipelago? And there is one more freedom. No one can deprive you of your family and property. You have already been deprived of them. And what does not exist, not even God can take away. And this is a basic freedom. It is good to think in imprisonment. And the most insignificant cause gives you a push in the direction of extended and important thoughts. Once in a long, long while, once in three years maybe, they brought a movie to camp. The film turned out to be the cheapest kind of sports comedy. It was a bore. But from the screen they kept drumming into the audience the moral of the film. The result is what counts, and the result is not in your favor. On the screen they kept laughing. In the hall the audience kept laughing too. But blinking as you came out into the sunlit camp yard, you kept thinking about this phrase. And during the evening you kept thinking about it on your bunk, and Monday morning out in the lineup. And you could keep thinking about it as long as you wanted. And where else could you have concentrated on it like that? And slow clarity descended into your brain. This was no joke. This was an infectious thought. It has long since been inculcated into our fatherland. And they keep on inculcating it over and over. The concept that only the material result counts has become so much a part of us that when, for example, some Tukakevsky, Yagoda, or Zinoviev was proclaimed, a traitor who had sidled up to the enemy, people only exclaimed in a chorus of astonishment, What more could he want? Now that is a high moral plane for you. Now that is a real unit of measure for you. What more could he want? Since he had a belly full of chow, and twenty suits, and two country homes, and an automobile, and an airplane, and fame, what more could he want? Millions of our compatriots find it unthinkable to imagine that a human being, and I am not speaking here of this particular trio, might have been motivated by something other than material gain. To such an extent has everyone been indoctrinated with and absorbed the slogan, the result is what counts. Whence did this come to us? If we look back at our history, maybe about three hundred years, could anything of the kind have taken place in the Russia of old believers? All this came to us from Peter I, from the glory of our banners and from the so-called honor of our fatherland. We were crushing our neighbors, we were expanding, and in our fatherland it became well established that, the result is what counts. And then from our Demidovs, Kabans, and Saibukins, they clambered up without looking behind them to see whose ears they were smashing with their jackboots, and ever more firmly it became established among a once pious and open-hearted people. The result is what counts. And then, from all kinds of socialists, and most of all from the most modern, infallible, and intolerant teaching, which consists of this one thing only. The result is what counts. It is important to forge a fighting party, and to seize power, and to hold on to power, and to remove all enemies, and to conquer in pig iron and steel, and to launch rockets. And though for this industry and for these rockets it was necessary to sacrifice the way of life, and the integrity of the family, and the spiritual health of the people, and the very soul of our fields and forests and rivers, to hell with them, the result is what counts. But that is a lie. Here we have been breaking our backs for years at all union hard labor. 
Here in slow annual spirals, we have been climbing up to an understanding of life, and from this height it can all be seen so clearly. It is not the result that counts. It is not the result, but the spirit. Not what, but how. Not what has been attained, but at what price. And so it is with us, the prisoners. If it is the result which counts, then it is also true that one must survive at any price. And what that means is, one must become a stool pigeon, betray one's comrades, and thereby get oneself set up comfortably, and perhaps even get time off sentence. In the light of the infallible teaching, there is, evidently, nothing reprehensible in this. After all, if one does that, then the result will be in our favor, and the result is what counts. No one is going to argue. It is pleasant to win, but not at the price of losing one's human countenance. If it is the result which counts, you must strain every nerve and sinew to avoid general work. You must bend down, be servile, act meanly, yet hang on to your position as a trustee and by this means survive, and by this means survive. If it is the essence that counts, then the time has come to reconcile yourself to general work, to tatters, to torn skin on the hands, to a piece of bread which is smaller and worse, and perhaps to death. You drag your way along proudly with an aching back, and that is when, when you have ceased to be afraid of threats and are not chasing after rewards, you become the most dangerous character in the owl-like view of the bosses, because what hold do they have on you? And as soon as you have renounced that aim of surviving at any price, and gone where the calm and simple people go, then imprisonment begins to transform your former character in an astonishing way to transform it in a direction most unexpected to you. And it would seem that in this situation, feelings of malice, the disturbance of being oppressed, aimless hate, irritability, and nervousness ought to multiply. But you yourself do not notice how, with the impalpable flow of time, slavery nurtures in you the shoots of contradictory feelings. Once upon a time you were sharply intolerant, you were constantly in a rush, and you were constantly short of time, and now you have time with interest. You are surfeited with it, with its months and its years behind you and ahead of you, and a beneficial calming fluid pours through your blood vessels. Patience. You are ascending. Formerly you never forgave anyone. You judged people without mercy, and you praised people with equal lack of moderation. And now an understanding mildness has become the basis of your uncategorical judgments. You have come to realize your own weakness, and you can therefore understand the weakness of others, and be astonished at another's strength, and wish to possess it yourself. The stones rustle beneath our feet. We are ascending. With the years, armor-plated restraint covers your heart and all your skin. You do not hasten to question, and you do not hasten to power. Your tongue has lost its flexible capacity for easy oscillation. Your eyes do not flash with gladness over good tidings, nor do they darken with grief. For you still have to verify whether that's how it is going to be, and you also have to work out what is gladness and what is grief. And now the rule of your life is this. Do not rejoice when you have found. Do not weep when you have lost. Your soul, which formerly was dry, now ripens from suffering. And even if you haven't come to love your neighbors in the Christian sense, you are at least learning to love those close to you, those close to you in spirit who surround you in slavery, and how many of us come to realize. It is particularly in slavery that for the first time we have learned to recognize genuine friendship and also those close to you in blood, who surrounded you in your former life, who loved you, while you played the tyrant over them. Here is a rewarding and inexhaustible direction for your thoughts. Reconsider all your previous life. 
Remember everything you did that was bad and shameful, and take thought. Can't you possibly correct it now? Yes, you have been imprisoned for nothing. You have nothing to repent of before the state and its laws. But, before your own conscience, but, in relation to other individuals, Following an operation, I am lying in the surgical ward of a camp hospital. I cannot move. I am hot and feverish. But nonetheless, my thoughts do not dissolve into delirium, and I am grateful to Dr. Boris Nikolaevich Kornfeld, who is sitting beside my cot and talking to me all evening. The light has been turned out, so it will not hurt my eyes. He and I, and there is no one else in the ward. Fervently, he tells me the long story of his conversion from Judaism to Christianity. This conversion was accomplished by an educated, cultivated person, one of his cellmates, some good-natured old fellow like Platon Karatayev. I am astonished at the conviction of the new convert, at the ardor of his words. We know each other very slightly, and he was not the one responsible for my treatment, but there was simply no one here with whom he could share his feelings. He was a gentle and well-mannered person. It is already late. All the hospital is asleep. Kornfeld is ending up his story thus. And on the whole, do you know, I have become convinced that there is no punishment that comes to us in this life on earth which is undeserved. Superficially, it can have nothing to do with what we are guilty of in actual fact. But if you go over your life with a fine-tooth comb and ponder it deeply, you will always be able to hunt down that transgression of yours for which you have now received this blow. I cannot see his face. Through the window come only the scattered reflections of the lights of the perimeter outside, and the door from the corridor gleams in a yellow electrical glow. But there is such mystical knowledge in his voice that I shudder. These were the last words of Boris Kornfeld. Noiselessly, he went out into the nighttime corridor and into one of the nearby wards, and there lay down to sleep. Everyone slept, and there was no one with whom he could speak even one word. And I went off to sleep myself, and I was wakened in the morning by running about and tramping in the corridor. The orderlies were carrying Kornfeld's body to the operating room. He had been dealt eight blows on the skull with a plasterer's mallet while he still slept. In our camp, it was the custom to kill immediately after rising time, when the barracks were all unlocked and open, and when no one had yet got up, when no one was stirring. And he died on the operating table, without regaining consciousness. And so it happened that Kornfeld's prophetic words were his last words on earth, and, directed to me, they lay upon me as an inheritance. You cannot brush off that kind of inheritance by shrugging your shoulders. But by that time I myself had matured to similar thoughts. I would have been inclined to endow his words with the significance of a universal law of life. However, one can get all tangled up that way. One would have to admit that on that basis those who had been punished even more cruelly than with prison, those shot, burned at the stake, were some sort of super evildoers. And yet... The innocent are those who get punished most zealously of all. And what would one have to say about our so evident torturers? Why does not fate punish them? Why do they prosper? And the only solution to this would be that the meaning of earthly existence lies not, as we have grown used to thinking, in prospering, but in the development of the soul. From that point of view, our torturers have been punished most horribly of all. They are turning into swine. They are departing downward from humanity. From that point of view, punishment is inflicted on those whose development holds out hope. But there was something else in Kornfeld's last words that touched a sensitive chord, and that I accept quite completely for myself, and many will accept the same for themselves. In the seventh year of my imprisonment, I had gone over and re-examined my life quite enough and had come to understand why everything had happened to me, both prison and, as an additional piece of my ballast, my malignant tumor. And I would not have murmured even if all that punishment had been considered inadequate. Punishment, but whose? Well, just think about that. 
whose. I lay there a long time in that recovery room from which Cornfeld had gone forth to his death, and all alone during sleepless nights I pondered with astonishment my own life and the turns it had taken. In accordance with my established camp custom, I set down my thoughts in rhymed verses so as to remember them. And the most accurate thing is to cite them here, just as they came from the pillow of a hospital patient, when the hard labor camp was still shuddering outside the windows in the wake of a revolt. When was it that I completely scattered the good seeds, one and all, for after all I spent my boyhood in the bright singing of thy temples. Bookish subtleties sparked brightly, piercing my arrogant brain. The secrets of the world were in my grasp, life's destiny as pliable as wax. Blood seethed, and every swirl gleamed iridescently before me. Without a tumble, the building of my faith quietly crumbled within my heart, but passing here between being and nothingness, stumbling and clutching at the edge. I look behind me with a grateful tremor upon the life that I have lived. Not with good judgment nor with desire are its twists and turns illumined, but with the even glow of the higher meaning, which became apparent to me only later on. And now with measuring cup returned to me, scooping up the living water, God of the universe, I believe again. Though I renounced you, you were with me. Looking back, I saw that for my whole conscious life I had not understood either myself or my strivings. What had seemed for so long to be beneficial now turned out in actuality to be fatal, and I had been striving to go in the opposite direction to that which was truly necessary to me. But just as the waves of the sea knock the inexperienced swimmer off his feet and keep tossing him back onto the shore, so also was I painfully tossed back on dry land by the blows of misfortune. And it was only because of this that I was able to travel the path which I had always really wanted to travel. It was granted to me to carry away from my prison years on my bent back, which nearly broke beneath its load, this essential experience. How a human becomes evil, and how good. In the intoxication of youthful successes I had felt myself to be infallible, and I was therefore cruel. In the surfeit of power I was a murderer and an oppressor. In my most evil moments I was convinced that I was doing good, and I was well supplied with systematic arguments. And it was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirrings of good. Gradually it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart, and through all human hearts. This line shifts. Inside us it oscillates with the years, and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained, and even in the best of all hearts there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. Since then I have come to understand the truth of all the religions of the world, they struggle with the evil inside a human being, inside every human being. It is impossible to expel evil from the world in its entirety, but it is possible to constrict it within each person. And since that time I have come to understand the falsehood of all the revolutions in history. They destroy only those carriers of evil contemporary with them, and also fail out of haste to discriminate the carriers of good as well. And they then take to themselves as their heritage the actual evil itself, magnified still more. The Nuremberg trials have to be regarded as one of the special achievements of the 20th century. They killed the very idea of evil, though they killed very few of the people who had been infected with it. Of course, Stalin deserves no credit here. He would have preferred to explain less and shoot more. And if by the 21st century humanity has not yet blown itself up and has not suffocated itself, perhaps it is this direction that will triumph? Yes, and if it does not triumph, 
then all humanity's history will have turned out to be an empty exercise in marking time without the tiniest might of meaning. Whither and to what end will we otherwise be moving, to beat the enemy over the head with a club? Even cavemen knew that. Know thyself. There is nothing that so aids and assists the awakening of omniscience within us as insistent thoughts about one's own transgressions, errors, mistakes. After the difficult cycles of such ponderings over many years, whenever I mentioned the heartlessness of our highest-ranking bureaucrats, the cruelty of our executioners, I remember myself and my captain's shoulder boards and the forward march of my battery through East Prussia, enshrouded in fire, and I say, so were we any better? When people express vexation, in my presence, over the West's tendency to crumble, its political short-sightedness, its divisiveness, its confusion, I recall too. Were we, before passing through the archipelago, more steadfast, firmer in our thoughts? And that is why I turn back to the years of my imprisonment and say, sometimes to the astonishment of those about me, Bless you, prison. Lev Tolstoy was right when he dreamed of being put in prison. At a current moment, that giant began to dry up. He actually needed prison as a drought needs a shower of rain. All the writers who wrote about prison but who did not themselves serve time there considered it their duty to express sympathy for prisoners and to curse prison. I have served enough time there. I nourished my soul there. And I say without hesitation, Bless you, prison, for having been in my life. And from beyond the grave come replies, It is very well for you to say that, when you came out of it alive. End of Part 4, Chapter 1